I want to talk about some very important missing risk factors for heart attacks, okay? Now, typically, when you look at risk factors for heart attack, you know, they're going to talk about high blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, family history, age, gender, because men are more at risk than females, uh, diabetes, cholesterol, and obesity, right? Well, today I'm going to talk about the other factors which I think are way more important as far as a risk factor. Like, what is a risk factor? Well, it's a certain variable. Um, it's something that contributes to something. It's something that you use to predict if something's going to happen or not. And to figure out these risk factors, they do various studies. Unfortunately, a lot of the studies are questionnaire studies. They're observational studies, which are not at the top of uh, reliable scientific studies. Unfortunately, nowadays, science has really become corrupted. In fact, it's become very, very political. I think that's probably why they call it political science. But uh, the question is, who is funding the science? Who's getting benefited indirectly? And then unfortunately, if you're opposing the, uh, the consensus of what science has found out, you're either silenced, censored, or you're not going to get funding for another study, or you might be labeled as a denier of something. And I do want to touch on the difference between cause and correlation, because there is a big difference, okay? Um, when something causes something, like, it would be like A causes B. But when something is correlated, A might occur at the same time as B, but that does not mean it caused B. It's a statistical relationship. It's some association. And unfortunately, every day on the news or the internet, you'll see things like, um, oh, high fat diet causes diabetes or heart disease or cancer. They're implying causation. And then you read the study and it absolutely positively has nothing to do with the causation. There might be an association, but then if you read further, you're going to find that the person wasn't just on a high fat diet. There were other variables, like they were also on a high carbohydrate diet at the same time. And because the ketogenic diet is a high fat diet, people assume that the high fat diet was a ketogenic diet when it's not. And so there's just a lot of manipulation when you see these studies nowadays. Like here's, here's an example of correlation, like inactivity causes weight gain. Well, it doesn't cause weight gain. I mean, it's associated, but it's not causation. Before I get into some actually really interesting information, I want to just first define a couple things related to this cholesterol thing right here, right? Many people that go on a ketogenic diet, they end up having higher amounts of cholesterol and then they get worried, they get upset, they're freaking out, what's going on? I want to really explain that. Um, when you go on keto, you switch from burning glucose to burning fat, okay? You're burning a lot of fat. And the fat cells are releasing and burning triglycerides and uh, cholesterol is also in the fat cell and that's going to be released. And so you're having a lot of oxidation of fat going through your bodies. And so the question is, is it dangerous? Is it pathogenic? Well, today we're going to talk a little more about this cholesterol because just because you have higher amounts of cholesterol does not mean there's a pathogenic situation going on at all. And by the way, as a side note, when they talk about obesity being a risk factor, there's something called an obesity paradox, which is wild because it is true that there is an increased risk of developing heart attacks if you have obesity. But having weight gain can actually be protective in those people who already had heart failure. Very interesting. I should do a video on that. But just because someone is overweight doesn't mean that's a risk factor. Personally, I think it's more of a visceral fat, okay? Not necessarily weight all over, but I don't want to get sidetracked. But this is what I want to explain right here. You have these things called lipoproteins, like the LDL, HDL. Basically what those are, they're little transportation shuttles, cargo uh, units that are transporting fat through the blood because most of the blood is water soluble. So we have to be able to push this fat through and so your body has these little containers or buses that it transports the fat. And they're protein shuttles, and inside you have the fat. Okay, so that's what they really are. And so when you have HDL, that's high-density lipoprotein, and LDL is low-density lipoprotein. Now, 
what do they mean this density thing? Well, they're really talking about the relationship between how dense something is with protein versus fat, okay? Because remember, we have this protein shell and then we have fat inside. So the high density lipoprotein would be a lot more protein, less fat, versus the low density protein, which would be less protein, higher amounts of fat. So the HDL is considered the good cholesterol and LDL is considered the so-called bad cholesterol, but there's some more information you need to know. There's, there's two types of LDL. If you look at LDL from another angle, there's uh, these little particle sizes. And so you have one type of the LDL called the small dense, okay? The particle size is small dense. And that is the type that is um, pathogenic. It creates problems. It can invade the arteries and start creating problems. But when you have the large buoyant particle size, okay, they don't invade the inside of the arteries, okay? They float around, but they're not creating problems for you. So this is why if you don't get an advanced lipid profile test, you're not gonna get this data. You're just gonna look at the total LDL and that might scare you, but I highly recommend you get um, the advanced lipid profile test. Now, there's something else I wanna bring up and I'm gonna keep this very, very simple because it gets complex. You have APOA1 and APOB. Now, what are these? So all you need to know is this one right here, APOAI, is a part of the protein in the HDL. Okay, remember this is a protein in fat. And then the APOB is the protein in the LDL. And understanding this relationship between these two, like the ratio of these two, is a way better indicator than even knowing your LDL or even your HDL, okay? This one, which is connected to HDL, is protective, okay? This one is atherogenic. And so the ratio of this, you want higher amount of this, lower amount of this, is a really good predictor of heart attacks, okay? But they don't really mention it on here. They just focus on cholesterol, right? So we really want to understand, is that LDL particle size small dense or more large buoyant, okay? That's what we want to know. And we also want to know the ratios between these two. It is helpful to understand triglycerides. Many times people have a high triglyceride when they do a lot of carbohydrates, not when they eat a lot of fat, because this is turned into energy in the body, okay? But this is not the best indicator uh, for heart attacks. This one is right here, okay? This might be a new term for you. Uh, again, I'm going to try to keep this really, really simple. LP and then small a, okay? That's as, as far as I'm going to go, as far as the depth of what this is. But basically, this is a really good indicator of heart attacks, okay? It's kind of like a variation of this LDL and it involves more oxidative LDL. The oxidation coming from carbs that can invade the arteries and create inflammation and clots, okay? And what this really does is it competes with the enzymes that you have that keep blood clots dissolved. So if we have too much of this, we increase our risk of clots in the body. This ratio here is a really good uh, risk factor and the small dense uh, LDL is a really good risk factor. Total LDL cholesterol, no, not a good indication to tell you what's going on in the heart, especially if you're on the ketogenic diet. All right, so now let's uh, go into these additional missing risk factors. The number one best risk factor, okay, I would even go so far to say that it's probably the causation of heart problems, okay? It's not even correlated, but that's just my own opinion. And I'll tell you why in a second. High insulin called hyperinsulinemia. You can also do a test to see how much insulin resistance you have, which is also correlated with high insulin too. It's called the HOMA IR test. It's a really good test to measure insulin resistance. And while you're testing that, you're also checking the high insulin too. Now, as far as high insulin goes, why is that so significant? as a risk factor? Well, because it explains most all other risk factors. You see, when you look at all this random data, the more you can align the data to one cause and everything makes sense, then chances are that's the most likely cause, okay? And in this case, let's pretend it is high insulin as the main causation, okay? Let's take a look at all of the other data. Does it make sense? Does high insulin 
cause high blood pressure? The answer is yes. Does it cause high cholesterol? Yes. Does it cause diabetes? Yes. If you're getting a high amount of sugar that's stimulating insulin over a period of time, you're going to develop insulin resistance. You're going to lose insulin's function and you're going to get diabetes. So a lot of diabetics initially have high insulin. Okay. Does high insulin cause obesity? Of course it does. Does high insulin cause high LDL, the small dense particle size? The answer is yes. Does high insulin cause another variable, which I'm going to put on the list, which is sleep apnea or sleeping problems in general? The answer is yes. And does high insulin explain the visceral fat? It sure does. And does high insulin explain another variable I'm going to talk about, which is inflammation? The answer is yes. And does high insulin explain uh, a high CAC score, which is a coronary artery calcification score? And the answer is a big fat yes because the calcium is coming in there from all the damage that's done from the high levels of insulin and insulin resistance. So let's go through the missing risk factors that relate to heart attacks. Number one, high insulin, and a test for insulin resistance called HOMA IR. Okay, number two, a CAC score, coronary artery calcification score. That basically correlates to how much calcium is in your arteries and that's one of the best predictors, not just of heart attacks, but of any reason for dying, okay? The more calcium you have in your arteries, the worse shape you are in. All right, number three, your APOB to APOA ratio. You want high APOA and you want low APOB. This gives you a very high statistical correlation and it's predictive of a heart attack, okay? Number four, LDL small dense particles. This will also give you a good prediction. And then we have number five, LP small a. This is a very powerful risk factor as well. And you should get a test done to see if yours is high or low. And number six, your sleep, right? If your sleep is poor, it will increase your risk of getting a heart attack. In fact, if your sleep is less than five hours a night, your risk factor for heart attacks goes way, way up. And then we have number seven, stress. Stress is a huge factor because we have this constant release of cortisol. Cortisol tends to act like insulin, mobilizing proteins and fats and turning those into sugar, which is then going to increase insulin. So number seven is really a part of number one. And then we have eight, visceral fat. That is the fat in your, around your organs that gives off inflammation and inflammation causes more insulin resistance. And if you have visceral fat, that also means you have liver fat. So really, it's not the, um, the superficial uh, subcutaneous fat that's around your body that's pathogenic. It's the visceral fat. That's my own viewpoint. And then we have number nine, inflammation. Okay, the more inflammation you have, the more insulin resistance you're going to have, the more insulin you're going to have, the more pathogenic, especially in your arteries. And where does that come from? Does it come from the saturated fat? No, it doesn't. It comes from the unsaturated fat, the absolute worst food that you can eat for the heart, okay, besides sugar and uh, refined carbohydrates, is the deep fried food. Because when you cook these unsaturated fats, okay, like soy oil, corn oil, canola, cottonseed oil, and even sunflower and safflower oil, what you're doing is you're generating a tremendous amount of inflammation in the body and you're contributing to heart disease, right? If you were to consume saturated fats or even deep fry in saturated fats, like lard, tallow, coconut oil, you would not have near the problem with inflammation because these unsaturated fats are very unstable and they're very inflammatory. What's really bizarre to me is what they're recommending to prevent a heart attack or what you should eat to prevent a heart attack, right? grains, polyunsaturated fats. Okay, this is what they're recommending if you have a heart problems. Beans, legumes, fruits. And uh, even they allow a good amount of added sugar. Don't ask me why. But like I said before, science is becoming more political and you're going to have to do your own research to find the truth. Now, if you have not seen my video on the coronary artery calcification score, that would be a really good one to watch next. I put it right here. Check it out.